Hello. Um, uh, thank you, B-Sides, for having me. I really appreciate it. This is, uh, you know, I think it's one of the, the better security events. Uh, I've spoken at B-Sides Las Vegas, San Francisco, Vancouver, Portland, uh, DC as well. Um, uh, last year, I actually presented at DEF CON, which was uh, pretty scary, actually. Um, so you guys are a little friendlier, hopefully. Um, yeah, don't throw anything, please. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about uh, data science or pseudoscience, applying data science concepts to InfoSec without a PhD. Um, that's my Twitter handle and my email. So if you guys do have questions and you don't want everyone to hear it, you know, feel free to um, email me. Um, I do want to have a disclaimer here. I am not a data scientist. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, but um, I, I've actually had the opportunity to work with uh, data scientists. Um, I actually went to a hackathon with uh, the company I work for, which I, I won't say where I work. Um, but um, they, I went to a hackathon with two PhDs. That, uh, one was from MIT, one was from Purdue. Um, I have a lot of respect for them and, and what they're doing. Um, I think one of the challenges has been, though, is communication uh, with uh, some of uh, the data scientists. I don't know, has anyone actually talked to a data scientist? Yeah. It's kind of difficult sometimes to get a straight answer from them uh, when you're actually having a discussion. And I think that's one of the challenges is we're sort of, we need, to, you know, uh, yes, no type of uh, answers. Um, and it's very difficult to get a concrete answer sometimes from a data scientist. Um, and it's also very difficult to understand some of those concepts and how they actually apply to InfoSec. Um, and so I, I really wanted to dig in deeper and try to identify how we can leverage data science um, and try to explain it in, in, in more simpler terms. Um, so just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Ken Weston. I've been uh, involved in security for, in technology for the last 16 years, uh, trained in both uh, defensive and offensive security. Um, I actually presented at uh, DEF CON last year where I talked about um, being a professional cyber stalker, um, where I actually put a lot of bad guys in jail um, using data. Um, so I was really interested in collecting information, data mining, um, open source intelligence in particular. Um, I'm currently focused on security analytics, um, and I hate tomatoes and math, so a little bit about me. Um, at DEF CON, I presented uh, about uh, you know, how I can actually mine information and track criminals. Um, so I was, I've been really interested in data for, for quite a, bit, a long time. Um, and when it comes to um, information security, particularly when it comes to the network, there's a lot of data uh, that we have available to us. You know, it starts at the endpoint. We had that with uh, AV. Uh, we expand that out. Now we have network security intelligence where we're looking at IDS, firewalls. We started actually doing correlation rules, you know, fairly simple, uh, your SIM use case. Um, then we started incorporating threat intelligence, and now we're dealing with even more information, more complex correlations. Um, does anyone here actually write uh, rules for your SIM? Okay. Does anyone here like writing rules for your SIM? <laughs> There's always one, all right. Um, but you know, from this, it's, it's really great for us when we, we get uh, start actually uh, doing these correlations because we learn a lot more about um, who's attacking us. Uh, particularly with some of the threat intelligence stuff that's been coming through with uh, Sticks and Taxi, we're able to share a lot more information. Um, but it's really difficult to write those correlation rules, and sometimes we can't actually identify all those different patterns, um, particularly when we talk about zero-day threats. And I'll talk about um, particularly around insider threat or advanced adversaries, um, usually when you're dealing with compromised credentials and things like that. So when it comes to uh, data science, I'm going to be focusing mostly on machine learning because that's kind of the area of interest right now. Um, I was really excited actually to see that there's a lot of uh, machine learning talks um, at B-Sides, and I'll, I'll kind of list some of those at the end. I, I highly recommend um, you uh, take a look at some of those. Um, and my goal here is to have you guys have a un basic understanding of machine learning um, and data science concepts um, so that uh, when you go there, you guys will be experts. Um, I really like this. Uh, this is actually from an internal uh, Google document where they're talking about um, uh, leveraging machine learning. Um, so apply machine learning like the great engineer you are, not like the great machine learning expert you aren't. Right? So what we can actually do is we can leverage things like machine learning, but we don't have to be data scientists ourselves. I'll walk through how some of those models get created in the process, um, and you guys will sort of understand why you don't want to spend your time doing that. Um, there are a lot of tools out there, uh, a lot of more things like UBA type tools, and I'll talk a little bit about that and how they work, um, that you can actually leverage. Um, but you also need to have an understanding of, of, some, of some of those terms, particularly when you're buying a, a machine learning product. Um, sometimes uh, w there's what I call uh, data Scientology that's actually happening. Um, <laughs> Particularly when we're talking about uh, with, with uh, the marketing terms, when you guys are walking the floor of Black Hat, you're, probably this year in RSA, you're going to hear a lot about machine learning. Um, and a lot of times, some of these security tools aren't actually using machine learning. They're just doing advanced correlations or maybe some statistics. 
Um, so I'm going to walk you guys through, and you'll understand some of the terms. Um, understand the difference between unsupervised versus supervised, so that when these vendors come up to you, you can ask those kind of questions. What sort of uh, machine learning are you guys leveraging? Uh, what sort of graphs? How does this work? Because um, I, I think it's really important for us to understand how those black boxes function. Just an example of some of the, I did a little word cloud. These are all the different terms I, I saw around um, data science, and um, it's really confusing. There's just a, a lot of um, kind of word soup. Um, I, I'm going to start a little bit with big data, because that's sort of how uh, the data science got started. Um, and this is the definition I looked up. Um, and I really thought this was funny, because if you look at the, uh, the actual uh, example sentence here, they say um, of how, how to leverage, how to use the uh, big data in a sentence, right? So much IT investment is going towards managing and maintaining big data. So it's not talking about the, um, the value that you're actually getting out of leveraging big data, but it's always about the cost, right, of collecting this information. Um, and so um, that's what I also have here. It's, let's solve this problem by using big data that none of us have the slightest idea what to do with. And I see this time and time again. I'm even see, seeing CISOs do this with some of the customers I go in and talk with. They start collecting a lot of information. They think that they're going to use this information at some point. But what they end up doing is just storing that information. And a lot of times, that data becomes a liability, particularly when you have log data in there. Um, you might have credit card information. You're actually opening yourself for a, a lot more liability as a result of that. Um, and sometimes, um, IT, IT guys don't quite understand that. So that's when, uh, with big data, uh, we're talking about when the shark actually jumps you. Uh, big data was a, a big buzzword, um, and so a lot of uh, IT organizations started gathering this information. Um, and then security guys are expected to also make sense of this information. Um, here's a, a terabytes of data, or petabytes of data. Uh, you know, what threats can you guys find in this um, information? And that's really difficult to do, uh, particularly when it comes to security. There's a lot of uh, insight that we can actually get from uh, big data, from information. But the trick is, um, whether it's security or not, is actually identifying and asking the questions, what do we want to do with this data? What sort of data sources do we want to actually do to accomplish this? We don't necessarily have to grab every single possible piece of data um, to bring it into the environment. And with security, it's not just uh, big data. So if you're actually doing NetFlow, full packet capture, um, you know, we've been doing uh, big data for a long time in security. We, all of our tools are very noisy. They generate a lot of, a lot of uh, machine data. Um, and when we're dealing with security, we're actually dealing with morbidly obese data in a lot of ways, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, it's, it's almost uh, sometimes ridiculous how much information we're actually dealing with. And sometimes it's good to sort of narrow the focus, identify key data sources, um, and what sort of reports we're going to actually generate from that. Um, what sort of threats are we actually looking for? Um, I will, I'll be the first to say that I believe that all data is security relevant, right? But not necessarily all pieces of that data. Um, you're going to want to look for, uh, you know, uh, time series information, uh, timestamps, IP addresses, and things like that. But you don't necessarily need, you know, the entire uh, like uh, the contents of a, of a log event, for example. Um, and there's a, a term that comes up a lot in um, data lake. And basically what, uh, what, what this means when I hear here in IT is I just think, oh, so you guys have a bunch of information that you don't know what you're going to do with yet. Um, but you're going to start collecting that information. Um, and this is what it sort of becomes, right? Um, particularly for security, these data lakes are not going to be particularly useful. Um, if it's just a bunch of stagnant data, um, when we're dealing with data, it has a half-life. Um, the longer we, we have that information, the less valuable it actually is. Um, our adversaries, they, they change their tactics, their tools constantly. Um, so if we're um, holding on to this information, the attack information that we're actually running models on a year ago um, is not going to be relevant today. Um, so what we want to do is we want to actually, um, I'll talk a little bit about how we make that data flow. So there's some differences bet then between big data versus data science. And I like to compare this as hoarders versus an Amazon warehouse, right? Anyone see the show Hoarders? Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so um, the idea here is like people collect the, all this inf all this uh, crap in their house. They can't get rid of it. They don't know. Um, you know, it's like a, it's a mental disorder almost. Um, but with a uh, Amazon warehouse, the idea is to get information in and, and get. Or, or, I'm sorry. To to get things in and get things out. It has throughput, right? In order to do that and actually to to accomplish that, they have to be highly efficient. Um, they have to be able to tag those particular uh, packages um, to actually get it out of, out of the door. So what we're doing is we're, we're talking about collection versus insight. When we actually start applying data science to our, our, our data flows, um, we're actually able to gain insight from that versus just 
hoarding that information. So we want to make big, big data flow. We want to move beyond just the data lake, but we, we want to uh, move into uh, this sort of flowing type of environment. That's how we're actually able to, to gain insight. And so one way we can accomplish that is with what's called a lambda architecture. You guys know where this is from? Am I dating myself? <laughs> All right. Revenge of the nerds. Lambda, 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 right? So, um, so you know, lambda in physics actually represents half-life or uh, a wavelength. It's also a pretty awesome game, right? It has a, the symbol for half-life, uh, the video game. Um, but a lambda architecture, uh, so a lambda architecture is a useful framework um, to think about designing big data applications. Um, Nathan Mars, uh, who worked at Twitter, uh, he uh, designed this generic architecture for addressing common requirements for big data based on, on his experience working on distributed data processing systems at Twitter. Uh, Lambda architecture is a data processing architecture. It's designed to handle ma uh, massive quantities of data by taking advantage of both batch and stream processing methods. This approach to, uh, to the architecture attempts to balance latency through um, and, and fault tolerance by using batch processing to pro provide comprehensive and accurate views of batch data, while simultaneously using real-time stream processing to provide views of streaming online data. So there's a lot of kind of technical gobbledygook, but what it actually allows us to do is to deal with a, a lot of massive uh, data sets. Uh, we can actually uh, move data into the master data set and allows us to run batch processes on that information. Um, this is important because this is where you're going to see a lot of machine learning algorithms leverage that data. Um, but then we're also able to uh, look at real-time information as well. And then we're able to run queries and we can actually see uh, this information flowing through. So if you look at a lot of the uh, tools for uh, machine learning for security, this is the type of architecture they're actually built on top of. Um, and if you want to get uh, a little more technical and try to build your own, these are sort of some of the tools, the open source tools you're going to hear about. Um, Hadoop, of course, uh, Cassandra, um, Spark for the, the speed layer, and then uh, Kafka for uh, gathering information. And if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend this book. It was actually written by uh, Nathan Morris from Twitter and how he actually built out this architecture. Um, if you don't want to learn about how to deploy Hadoop, things like that, you don't need to, but the first maybe three to four um, uh, chapters I highly recommend, at least you understand a little bit more how that works. So now we're talking about how to uh, collect information, how to get it to flow. Um, so now I want to go into a little bit more on the actual data science part. So data science, how does it work? So this is um, uh, by Drew Conway. Uh, it's, a, it's a Venn diagram, the, the data science Venn diagram. Uh, where it kind of talks about all the different skill sets that actually are important for, uh, for, for data science. Um, you know, the hacking skills are not necessarily, you know, um, trying to hack into to networks, things like that, that we're familiar with. Um, it's actually more just command line skills, right? The ability to collect and manipulate and extract data um, and how to manipulate the text files of the command line is important. Uh, math and statistics knowledge, um, that's where I get a little scared sometimes. Uh, some of the, the, the guys that are in data science, they're just wizards when it comes to this. Uh, understand math and statistical methods, which requires at least a baseline familiar, familiarity with some of the, the tools. And I'll talk about some of the tools as well. Um, some, something of experience, I think this is a imp really important factor. This is where there's a bit of a disconnect when it comes to uh, using data science, machine learning, and security. Um, let's just say for uh, there's a report that maybe is out there, um, and there's this report that's really popular. It talks about all the vulnerabilities that are actually um, the, that are targeting organizations. Here's the top five vulnerabilities. One of them might have been a freak, right? Um, but the problem with that data was it, it actually came from some data scientists, and they actually um, were able to pull this information from IDS and vulnerability management applications. But they didn't quite realize is that there's a lot of false positives um, in that data. Um, so data scientists, they may go look at the data, but without any sort of knowledge when it comes to security, they, they, they don't really understand how to make sense of it, and they start to make assumptions. And that's, a, that's where things get really dangerous, when we start talking about this danger zone here, right? So you have the, 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 the skills, um, you, just enough to get dangerous, but if you don't have that substantive experience, um, it, it's, it, it, um, a lot of things can, can fall apart. So when I talk about machine learning, a lot of the times people will say, oh, you know, it's AI, they're going to come take my job. I guarantee you that um, security analysts in particular, uh, um, the salaries are increasing. Um, the goal here in, in actually leveraging data science and machine learning is not to replace you. The goal is to enhance you. So this is more what it's going to look like. So leveraging things like machine learning, we're going to be able to identify patterns. We're going to see things in our environments and our data that we weren't able to see before. Um, so that's the whole idea of this. 
And a lot of times, too, if you actually leverage machine learning, um, you don't have to hire maybe quite as many analysts. Um, but um, you'll also um, have a, a fatter paycheck as well if you actually understand some of these concepts and can deploy them. So some of the tools that are actually used um, in, um, for machine learning, uh, there's Java, Scala, um, R. So these three are usually what you're going to see uh, data scientists use. Um, I stick with Python because that's basically what I know how to program in. I'm kind of a shitty programmer, and I know Python, so that's what I work with. Um, and in Python, there's actually a really cool library called scikit-learn. So has anyone used this library before? I'm curious. So, you, so I'm kind of curious. How many of you are actually using machine learning in your environments? Very cool. Awesome. It's really good to see. Um, so uh, there's a lot of algorithms that actually come with the, the, this. Uh, you can actually look here. If you go to the website, um, there's uh, algorithms for classification, regression. And I'll kind of uh, go through and define some of those and what they are. Um, but one of the challenges, too, is that you also have to uh, visualize that information. I think one of the critical things for the analyst is not necessarily just gaining that insight, but how do you actually make that information useful to the analyst so it makes sense to them. Um, and so what I actually use is uh, Splunk. Um, they actually have a machine learning toolkit that's free. Um, so you can actually download the free version of Splunk, and then you can run all these exercises I'm walking through. I'm actually going to use uh, some of their demos, actually. Um, you can uh, download Splunk directly from their website. You run it uh, local on your computer, which I'm going to do. Um, you install this application, and then the, um, it'll show you there's another dependent application that you have to install, um, and you're good to go. And the nice thing about this is that I don't have to worry about visualization. There's uh, all sorts of visualizations that are available to me, uh, so I can run my, uh, and create models and then create these nice visualizations without having to mess with a bunch of other dependencies. Um, I'm kind of lazy, so trying to install these different dependencies and do visualization in Python is really hard. And it takes more time than I want to spend on it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about different types of machine learning. Uh, there's two main uh, types. There's supervised machine learning, uh, where the focus is to build models that make predictions based on evidence and labeled data in the presence of uncertainty. As adaptive um, algorithms identify patterns in data, it sort of learns from those observations. Um, and you create models as a result of that. Then you have unsupervised machine learning. Um, this is where we're able to draw inferences from data sets that may not have labels. And I'll talk about the differences between label and unlabeled data. Uh, there's also semi-supervised machine learning, uh, which it gets a little more advanced. Um, but it's talking more about um, using labeled data to, um, to go out and actually label unlabeled, um, uh, unlabeled data. So if we're, we're able to uh, do supervised learning, we're generalized from, uh, from uh, some of the, uh, the labeled data. So this is an example. Uh, we're able to identify that. Usually that data is in a, in some sort of a table, um, but just um, nice visualization there of it. Uh, supervised machine learning, there's uh, three co core areas uh, that it's actually used. So regression. So a regression problem is when the output variable is a real value, such as authorizations over time. And I'll show some examples of that. Uh, classification is a classification problem when the output variable is a category, um, sort of, it could be binary, it could be malicious, non-malicious, authorized or not authorized, spam, not spam. Um, and then you have anomaly detection where you're able to identify unusual activity, uh, learn what normal looks like. An uh, example would be a history of normal web authorizations to then identify anything significantly different. Um, this can also be used a lot in fraud, right? So here's sort of the process that we go through with us uh, to create a supervised machine lear uh, learning algorithm, right? So we have raw security event data. Um, the uh, data scientist will create, uh, take a sample. He'll start developing and training the model. Um, and then he'll test that. And it's a highly iterative process. He'll write an algorithm, and then he'll, he'll have a product, right? But he's not done yet. A lot of times when they write these algorithms, it's one thing to have, you know, to run these models on very clean data, but when you actually release these out into the real world and look at real data, um, that's when sometimes things will fall apart and the wheels will come off. Um, and that's where we, you have to have um, a, a sort of this verification process. Then we actually move that into production. So this is very similar to a process you might have for maybe developing correlation rules, IDRS rules, firewall rules. Um, so just imagine that process, but maybe 10 times more complex, more math, and a lot more profanity. <laughs> and then th this is what it might look like. So this is uh, a sample. So uh, maybe we're running um, um, a model where we're trying to identify malicious uh, domains. Um, so 
um, it's going through and it can identify you know, using, uh, this is all uh, sort of tag, uh, in from tag data, um, and it can create and identify that yes, these two are malicious. Um, you know, hey, a string of consonants, you know, uh, numbers, um, all these sorts of things, that uh, has identified uh, malicious uh, domains. What it's actually looking at is a list of known malicious domains. So you have to have a list of known uh, uh, malicious domains to run this sort of thing, uh, where I can actually start to differentiate and identify the differences between those. So uh, with supervised machine learning with regression, uh, so it's used for predictive modeling to investigate the relationship between a dependent uh, target and independent variable. Uh, so a few examples of algorithms that you're going to run into. So this is, you know, memorize these using the cocktail parties. You know, sound smart. Um, <laughs> I'm going to focus just uh, here on, on linear regression in our example. Uh, it's one you're going to run into quite a bit. So I'm going to do a demo where we're actually going to predict uh, VPN usage. So let's say you've been tasked with identifying or predicting um, how much uh, are your VPN is going to be used. And I know this never happens, but the IT guys, they forgot to enable logging on the VPN. It never happens in real life, I know. Um, but uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at internal applications. We're going to look at how they're used. And we know that in order to use an internal application, they have to access the VPN so we can make a prediction about uh, VPN usage based on that information. So without further ado, please work. So I have a, uh, there's a CSV file, it's app usage, it's basically that same data I, I, I showed you. Um, here's what it actually looks like. It's just a simple CSV file with the data and it's tagged. Uh, so I have CRM, I have Cloud Drive, ERP expenses. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm bringing in the CRM, uh, the, the Cloud Drive, HR, and Webmail. I'm gonna use those for my prediction. Uh, then what I do, I can run this, I fit this to the model. Takes a bit to run, and this maps it out to me. So remember what I talked about why I use Splunk for the visualization, right? This is super simple. This is built in, in into the app, so I don't have to, to, um, to create the visualization. It actually plots it out. So what it's doing is actually showing the, the VPN usage um, of, based on uh, the usage of these applications. So we can start to make predictions based on that. So I don't know what the actual VPN data is, but I know that there, there's a relationship between the applications and VPN, and then I'm able to make these predictions. So another one is with uh, machine learning classification. So in classification, we have data that we want to sort um, in, into predetermined categories. So um, I'm going to be using binary classification, so uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different than some other ones where we're actually looking at yes, no, or true, false. Um, so again, I'm trying to keep these really kind of uh, dumbed down and, and fairly simple. So this is what our, 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 our uh, CSV file looks like in Excel. We've cleaned it up. So uh, here, sorry, basically we have a, a training data set that's been cleaned up for us. Uh, we have uh, data samples from multiple firewalls. Some of the firewalls we know are affected by malware and have critical vulnerabilities. We may know that the number uh, of our firewalls are affected by a critical vulnerability, but are not sure if they have been exploited by malware targeting that vulnerability. Or the inverse may be the case, where we suddenly see a number of firewalls hit by malware, and we want to identify if they're affected actually by a known vulnerability. Right? So this is, again, is another example of uh, it's important to have domain expertise. So what we're seeing um, is there's a slight anomaly in the data that hints at malware behavior. Uh, then we add a particular host um, has known vulnerabilities to actually predict make a prediction. So I'm going to do example, demo gods. So in classification, we have data that we want to sort into predetermined categories. So I'm going to click on this. Work. So here I'm bringing in that firewall uh, traffic CSV data. So here what I've done, I'm going to be predicting is, you know, is this firewall uh, affected by malware? So some of the, um, the fields I'm bringing in, bytes received, bytes sent, destination port, um, if it has a known vulnerability or not. Uh, maybe, maybe this is coming from our vulnerability management tool. Packets received, packets sent. I can then run and fit my model. So now we're down here with our classification results. So what this does is it's looking at the data and it's actually uh, looked at how successful it was with this prediction. So for the, 
uh, the predicted no, is it affected by uh, malware? It has an 83% confidence. Predicting yes, it has a 78% uh, confidence. And I can add additional fields. Maybe if I can remove, remove one, let's say I remove, I don't know if it's vulnerable or not. There's a vulnerability on that host. Sorry, it takes a little run to process here. So here we have the ability to predict is, is, is at 90%, but with our no, there's not really confidence. It's like about 50 50. So another one would be uh, anomaly detection uh, numeric outliers. So what we're going to do is look at uh, logins versus predicted over time. So here we see we have our, our uh, logins page. We actually uh, have cleaned up that data. We've loaded it in. So what we want to do is identify any sort of anomalies that are, that are outside the norm. It sort of establishes this baseline. And we see a number of outliers, right, that are actually in this graph. Another nice thing is the visualization. Um, so let's say I want to uh, up, update the threshold for this. So then I'll have fewer outliers, of course. Okay. And now I see that, okay, there's something that's happening here. So this is another uh, example of um, having the substantive experience when it comes to this. So on November 26th, we were attacked, right? All of a sudden, we had a bunch of people logging into our e-commerce website, and they're, they're trying to hack us, right? No? Black Friday, Black Friday. right? So there's sort of th this sort of thing that the, the machines, they, they don't know about Black Friday. They don't know about holidays. So you'd have to go through and train the model, and you would add some more uh, additional um, um, exceptions and things like that to the model that, so it understands that. Or you know, maybe this comes through. You pass this to your, uh, to, to your incident responders. Um, and you know it's a false positive. So this is just a few examples of actually uh, supervised machine learning. So as you can see, it's, it's a lot of work to go through this process. You're actually creating these models, making uh, assumptions. You're looking at the data. It's, you're constantly tweaking it. It, it just it takes a, a quite a bit of work. And I have a lot of respect for the folks that actually leverage this. Um, now I'm going to talk about unsupervised uh, machine learning. So unsupervised machine learning is where you have no labels in the data. So we had nice columns of information uh, before with our supervised machine learning. Uh, with this, we don't know. Um, a good example of this is, um, I think a good analogy, is Netflix. So when we're looking at movies, uh, we know, hey, there's romance, action, right? Those are things, that's a good example of supervised machine learning, things we're telling the system and we're categorizing that. Um, with unsupervised machine learning, it's more like, Okay, well, um, maybe things we don't know about. Identifying, well, did you know that uh, girls between 12 and 30 like uh, Rene Zellweger types of movies? Um, it maybe not always uh, rom-com, um, but there's a lot of insight that, uh, uh, that people like Netflix can actually gain from that as a result of it, uh, maybe for marketing purposes and things like that. But we can also do that with our, our adversaries, particularly when we're talking about um, user behavior, and we'll show some examples of that. Um, we can actually identify anomalies within our environment. So unsupervised machine learning is the general understanding of the present data by discovering hidden patterns. Uh, so in contrast, again, to supervised uh, learning, we are uh, working with the data that is not marked or indicated by labels. Um, and here are some examples, again, of um, some algorithms that you're going to hear about, again, using cocktail parties, we sound smart. Um, the most popular one you're going to hear about is k-means, um, and that's what uh, most, most folks use to actually identify those clusters. Um, the unsupervised machine learning process looks a little simpler. Uh, you have raw security data, you have an algorithm, and then it has a sort of automated clustering. Um, and, uh, and primarily where this is going to be used is going to be a, a, it's called UEBA. It used to be called just UBA, but Gardner changed that. Uh, now it's User Entity Behavior Analytics. Um, and really it's used a lot for identifying authorized, unauthorized users, uh, using authorized credentials, doing unauthorized things. So this is an area of security that's very difficult for, for SIMs to, to track. SIMs are really good at knowing about uh, you know, uh, known threats, incorporating threat intelligence maybe, um, bringing in IDS signatures and things like that. But what about uh, uh, attacks that don't have those signatures, compromised credentials, or if someone is using advanced malware to uh, get into your organization, or you have an insider, a malicious insider who's, who's accessing uh, data they shouldn't. Um, so a couple of interesting use cases uh, that, uh, that UBA helps with um, is um, you know, account takeover, so privileged account compromise, uh, data exfiltration, 
Uh, when you have lateral movement within, the or within uh, a network as well, it's good at detecting that. Uh, any sort of suspicious activity, malware attacks, botnet, command and control, um, especially like things like ransomware the, where the, the C2 infrastructure is constantly changing. Um, you can't necessarily rely on just on threat intelligence, uh, particularly with some of the more sophisticated uh, um, ransomware that's coming out. Uh, you also do user and entity behavior analytics as well. So suspicious behavior by accounts or devices. So it can be compromised credentials or it can be compromised systems. So I really like this. Uh, SANS, uh, about a few months ago, they had this, uh, uh, it was a summit for incident response and threat hunting. And uh, they actually modeled out the, uh, this threat hunting maturity model um, where you know, most folks are using ad hoc search, statistical analysis, visualization techniques, and aggregation. So here we have you know, basic log search. We have uh, maybe creating uh, some dashboards, visualizations, leveraging our SIM. Right? We have uh, maybe even up to some advanced correlations. And then what we're starting to see is more machine learning and data science being leveraged. And they actually pulled them, uh, the people that are in attendance, and this is what it worked out to. At least 85% are using search. You kind of have to have that. Um, so even if you identify uh, something strange here, you have to be able to go back and access the, the original log data uh, for your, uh, for your uh, forensic analysis. Statistical analysis, in, in about 55%. Visualization techniques are around 50%. So 32% um, are leveraging something in the, this machine learning data science area. Either they're doing it directly themselves or trying to, or they're, um, they're using a tool, a, an existing security tool that maybe has an add-on or like what we saw with an app. All right, who is this guy? That's right, Kasparov. So how, why is he famous? All right. He's not famous because he's a good chess player. He's famous because he got his butt kicked by a computer, right? <laughs> um, well, what's interesting is that Kasparov, you know, after he, uh, he did get beat by a computer at chess, um, they actually did some additional exercises where they actually did what they called freestyle chess. Um, and where they actually found was that um, a weak human plus machine uh, and better process was superior to a strong computer alone and more remarkably superior to a strong human uh, plus machine and inferior process. So, Someone who is not necessarily uh, you know, good at chess, having machines to, to uh, strategize, um, it's, it's really um, interesting that you know, the combination of that, the strong humans, the machines, and the, pro and period, and the process were better, right? So, um, so this carries over into what we're doing, right? So leveraging machine learning, we don't want to rely on it completely. We still have to have the, the strong analysts. We still have to have a, a process around it. Um, so one um, thing I want to talk about too that we want to incorporate um, from data science is threat uh, modeling with uh, graphs. So um, I'll show some examples of this, but um, graph-based threat computation where we're actually able to build graphs of anomalies and detect neighborhoods of anomalies that indicate that there's malware activity. Uh, we're able to do uh, multiple, multiple internal nodes beaconing as an example to the same IP address. Uh, it's geared towards detecting malware and um, those types of threats. We also have pattern-based computation uh, where we actually compute threat based on patterns that can be observed over uh, sets of anomalies. So this is where, when you actually are identifying uh, anomalies within the environment, uh, we want to we want to map that to the, the threat models. Um, that's where the substantive experience comes in. So this is what the the UBA model uh, looks like. So what we're doing is we're bringing in raw security data. Uh, we're running machine learning. And a lot of these, uh, like UBA tools, it'll use a combination of uh, unsupervised machine learning, machine learning, statistical analysis, a lot of other um, components and, um, and algorithms that will actually be leveraged to actually identify those anomalies. Um, they can even um, incorporate things like threat intelligence data. So a lot of the data that you're already collecting and using in your SIM, you can actually bring um, into these systems and it'll start to identify some of those anomalies. Um, then what we do is using the graph mining concept. So here we use anomalies graph on any relationships. What that'll actually do is it'll start to score and it'll look for connections in those anomalies. Um, and then from that, what we have is what I call anomaly chains. We actually do is identify the threats, right? So now what we're doing is, uh, for example, is we, we see an anomaly from a strange IP address. Uh, we see something on an endpoint uh, that connected to that IP address. And, uh, and we're able to see that, hey, there's a, a registry change. Um, and then we see some beaconing activity out to another IP address or something else, right? 
So now what we're able to do is, it's not just an anomaly, something strange that happened, because uh, if you go chasing those anomalies, you're gonna spend a lot of time. You think you know, uh, firewalls and IDS uh, false positives were a pain. Uh, if you go chasing anomalies, that's, it's almost a dead end a lot of times. Um, and that's actually been a challenge with some of the early U, uh, UVA types of tools is that people would get these anomalies and they wouldn't have the information to, to do anything with it. Okay, something strange happened. Uh, what does this mean within my environment? I don't understand, right? But when we start to chain them together and we actually identify those threats, um, it's gonna make a lot more sense to the analyst. Uh, so then, then we mapped out the threat model. So we may uh, map it to um, you know, lateral movement, right? So um, uh, beaconing or you know, all the different threat models that we would consider uh, um, in our organization. We start to map those anomalies. You know, is this, does this look like lateral movement? Does this look like beaconing? Uh, land speed violation, you guys know what that is? The Superman problem. Basically, if, uh, if I log in here from Las Vegas and then all of a sudden I log in from Moscow, there's no physical way I, I can actually um, you know, be in two places at once, right? So those are you know, based off GOIP, things like that. Um, and then what we're doing is we map that course the HCI component, like the human component, where we actually can map those threat models when we do the visualization where, let's map that to the Lockheed Martin kill chain. Um, so if we're talking about um, this particular case here, it's like, hey, we see where the, the actual, um, uh, where they actually got in. We see that there was some lateral movement where they were actually collecting data. Um, and then we see that, hey, there was an exfiltration event. Um, and we can actually map that out and visualize it for the analyst. Um, and then we can also go in and do forensic artifacts. We gather other information. So now the analyst can not only identify that there's a threat, he sees the connection, he can also dig deeper and, and actually look at those events um, and, um, and either you know, pass that off to a, someone else to go and remediate those systems or identify that we have a larger problem. Is this part of a larger attack as well? Um, and also you know, threat and risk warning, things like that. So, so that is it for my presentation. Um, since you guys all sat in for almost like 40 minutes, of a talk on data science. I'm giving you guys your doctorate of divinity in data science. You guys are all now PhDs. Um, so when you get your slide, print this out, show it to your employer, all right? Um, so I, I, again, I think it's really interesting that um, there's a lot of great talks on machine learning. I wanted to highlight some of the, the other talks that are happening. Um, this one here, uh, Joe Sade and, and Rod Soto, they're uh, friends of mine, I uh, really recommend taking a look at that one. But these all look really interesting. I think it's really interesting how machine learning is actually being leveraged. Um, it's, it's gone from you know, something that was sort of theoretical um, to some of the tools I'm seeing actually identifying some of these threats. I've seen it in, um, well, actually in some of the customers I'm on site with, where they started to run these tools. Um, it takes about, you know, it can take anywhere from about six weeks uh, before you'll actually start to identify those anomalies. And, and, and um, it's very different than your, your sim use case where you can write the correlation and see it now. Um, it takes about six weeks or so for it to actually learn what normal is in the environment. Um, but it's really interesting, even highly sophisticated security organizations where their, their maturity is very high, they have very uh, good correlation rules, they're able to identify a lot of threats, they're finding things that they wouldn't have seen before, right? So um, I believe that machine learning isn't going to replace your existing um, security best practices, it's not going to replace your SIM, but again, just like it's going to enhance your, the analyst, it's going to enhance your security program. You're going to identify threats you didn't see before. Um, another thing I found too is that you'll start to look at anomalies, right? So um, the, the SOCs can look at the threats. They're going to look at the chain of anomalies, whereas your hunters, um, they might, might actually go dig into those anomalies specifically. Because a lot of times what they'll find is that, is this something that maybe one of our correlation rules in our SIM should have picked up? And sometimes it's yes. So it'll allow them to also go through and fine tune some of those, those, uh, their correlation rules as well. So. And that is it for my talk uh, a little bit early. Uh, I'm on Twitter, K Weston. Uh, feel free to email me, um, death threats, whatever you know, works. Um, I guess we have a little bit of a few, some, some time for questions. I hope you guys don't get too technical on me because, again, I'm not a data scientist. So, any questions? If you're using questions, please use the, speak, the mic up here for so recording this so that other people will send it. Hey, yeah, great talk so far. But um, you mentioned you're using the, the tooling from Splunk for your visualizations and some of your modeling. Are you aware of any tools related or used for like Elasticsearch or those platforms? Um, I haven't seen any for machine learning. Is anyone else, is anyone using Elastic and uh, machine learning? Anyone using Elastic and machine learning?
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I use I use Splunk because I know it, and uh, it's, it's also where like data that I have I want to go and look at is going to be in. So that's just the tool that I use. There's, that's why I wanted to list all the different tools. There's tons of them out there. I don't even understand how some of them work, frankly. Um, that's well well beyond uh, what I do. Uh, but it's, it's important to understand the, what tools that some of the data scientists are using. So at least you can understand, hey, they're using Scala. Um, well, maybe that's not going to work in my environment. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's what I was going to say. If you're if you're doing a lot of data science scientists with like Python, uh, IPython no notebook, everybody's familiar with that. And now there's this thing called Jupyter Notebook that's kind of like the same thing, and you can do a lot of really cool visualizations with that as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's great too. Like I'm just experimenting and, and learning how these things work. Um, I'm I'm never going to become a data scientist myself. Um, I don't have the time, but I'm, I'm more of the security analyst. But I still want to understand how things work, right? Um, I don't just want to trust that, hey, you know, use data science, it's a black box, it's going to solve all your security problems. Um, I want to understand the differences between the different algorithms, um, at least so I can have a conversation with uh, folks when we actually look at some of this data. Um, it's also good, I think, to be able to understand some of those basic concepts. So uh, when you actually go get funding for some of these tools, um, you know, well, how does it work? Um, well, here's, here's how we can actually identify new threats and things like that. So um, it's not necessarily important where the data is and how it's stored. Um, you can use Elastic. You can use uh, any sort of uh, other data source. Like I'm just using CSV files, right? Um, but, you know, the, the important thing is it's just more around the general concepts, I think. So, because there were no other questions, I just wanted to make a quick comment that uh, there is a project that I'm working on that almost is exactly that Lambda architecture slide that you had in the components and things like that. It's a new Apache project called Metron. So, if people want to play. Metron, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Great. So, any more questions? Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.